I'd like to welcome you to the Finger Lakes Boating Museum Academy. This is our first lecture of the year, of 2019. Oh, put you um, in right. So, and we have our new academy booklet printed out with all our educational activity. It's in the back if you'd like to grab one in our new brochure for this year. And we're very proud to have Andy Gugliata here to talk about ice fishing and kind of like a beginning introduction to ice fishing. It's not just sitting on your butt drinking beer. It's much more, it's more involved. <laughs> so we're going to get a nice uh, lecture from Andy, and we thank him for coming. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very yeah, so basically my plan for this would be to get us started just kind of going through the safety aspects of ice fishing into the different setups for the different lakes, what to look at at the lakes, because there's a lot of things you need to be kind of aware of in terms of safety-wise, and then what to fish for in the lakes. And then I'll get more into some of the gear, and I'll probably wind up passing some of it around, but obviously don't hook yourself. All the stuff has hooks, and it's all rigged up so you can kind of see it. So I'm going to go ahead and start right through kind of with the safety end of things. Um, this area in particular, ice thickness is, 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 is a real concern. It's the end of January and we still don't have ice. It's just starting to lock up on Cuca Lake right now, but that's a concern because we're going to get snow on it and that's going to ruin the ice because snow is a huge insulator. So for ice thickness, and I think the museum said that they can maybe print this out later on and then get it to you, but if, if I don't know if that's, if I'm putting you guys in the spot with that or not, but I don't have printed charts of this, but you guys, everyone's more than welcome of having the PowerPoint and it's kind of a nice way to go through it. But for um, safety, four inches is really what you want to walk on. A lot of the forums you get on, a lot of guys are out on two inches and three inches. Around here, I really wouldn't go out on it. I mean, I spend a lot of time on the ice and I really, I don't, I don't play with anything above four inches. Um, when you are out there, it really is important to have, um, I'll just pass this around, they're dirty, if you don't want to touch them, that's fine. Um, they're, the spikes that go on the bottom of your boots, and I always buy a size kind of a little bit bigger because it can be, you know, you can slip and fall. Actually, my, my father slipped and really injured his back on the ice, and it's, 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 it's ice. So, I mean, you guys have seen those. You can, I'll kind of pass around, but they, you can even slip them over your shoes if you want. They go on really easy, but they're easy on, easy off for cold weather. Um, life vest. I look a little goofy when I go out because I wear a life vest the entire time. Um, especially around here, I have fallen in once and it's, it's helpful. Um, rope, I always bring a rope with me and, um, and an ice screw actually. I have that, so if I, I fish with a partner, so if one of us falls in, I have an ice screw I can set into the ice and then a rope to fall out, to throw out there. Doesn't happen on a regular basis. I've fished thousands of hours on the ice and I've only fallen in once. But with that being said, I am typically overprepared for it because I don't, it's, it's not a fun, comfortable feeling and I, I, we want to have a way out. Um, so rope and, and ice screw is the best way out. Yeah, no, go for it. Yeah, let's, let's actually keep it in open forums. That would be the easiest way to run this. Screw, just, you just... Um, I did a lot of ice climbing growing up. So it, there, there's different ice screws, but if you get online, I, I get one that's an easy, easy turn. There's a, you can tell that's on there. Like, um, it's just a swivel, so you can literally just jam it in the ground and oh, turn it quickly in the hole in the bottom there. Yep. A lot of the ones you buy at the store, they don't have that hole in the bottom because they're not set up for ice climbing. These are set up for really fast, efficient, you know, in, 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 to be able to insert into the ice efficiently. So, but any ice screw, but a, really a rope, a life jacket, and a partner, you'll, you'll be able to get out. But what I don't want to do is I don't want to set the beginning of this course up like you need to be afraid of ice fishing. You don't. If you have four inches of ice, you're going to be fine. Um, with that varied ice thickness, a lot of our area is hills on both sides. So as soon as you get towards the spring, you have runoff, and runoff goes over the top of the ice. Then you get a snowstorm, you're not going to see that, that eats up at the ice pretty quick. So you can go from, you know, <laughs> six inches to an inch. And that's why, um, and I, I didn't start with one of these, but after I fell in, I never went on the ice without it. It's a spud bar. It's a really, really heavy bar. I put a rope on it because when you're hitting the ice, and if you do go through, you lose your bar. So you, when, when I walk, I kind of keep that in front of me, and I really, you know, hit, hit the ice two good hits each time as you walk. It'll let you know if you hit two good hits, you're not going to go through. So that's just, I, w I, wouldn't, I wouldn't enter the ice without a life jacket on, that, this, and then also um, the spikes for your hands. If you, if you do go in, these, um, you can put them in your pockets, you can put it around your neck. I kind of don't like it around my neck because when you go into drill holes, it just gets clogged up on you. But if you have them in your outside pockets, you can get to them. They have um, nails in them. So if you do go in, you can reach up and you can get your way out because as soon as you fall in, the ice is going to be very slippery around you. Like I said, you're not going to fall in. So it's just, I would, if you do, be, be over prepared for it. Um, dry clothes in the car. 
I did have those that day, and it was awesome. <laughs> it feels good getting dry clothes on. So with that, with all of this information, there's a ton of information online. Some of it's hard to weed through. As we go through the presentation, I'll give you some sites that you can go to that you can find some reputable information and easily you know, accessible information. There is a video, and I watch this kind of at the beginning of every year. It is six minutes, but I do think it's worth everybody's time. What this guy does is he shows you how to get out of the water and what your body goes through if you do fall in. And like I said, once I get through this part of it, I won't talk about it again, but I do think it's important to talk about the safety aspects of it first. Adam from Pike Pole Fishing. Today we're going to go out and do a, a fall through the ice on purpose, believe it or not, uh, just to show you guys how to do a self-rescue. Uh, we're doing this without a suit. We're going to do it real time, real life. And uh, don't try this at home. We do have the Edgerton Fire Department standing by. Just in case. Uh, hopefully everything will go right. And uh, we'll get uh, wet here in just a second. Stand by. Roll. 
Typically, the fire department around here isn't going to be on hand, so it would be the first two that would really be <laughs> the options of getting out. And I think the important part of that is your body goes through shock, but it will get better, right? So as soon as you're able to recover, don't try to get out because you're going to burn all your energy up trying to get out while you're in shock. Let your body calm down, then get out. Yeah? Early on, the admonition was don't panic. Right. Drowning victims panic. What happens here? You don't panic? Well, I, I, I think I think I think the idea would be try your best to remain under remain under control. It's life or death. I mean, yeah, it's gonna be scary. I, I, I'm not saying I wouldn't panic when I go in there, but I would keep a level head and let your body calm down before you try to get out. Well, drowning victim to panic, climb the rescuer. Right, right. So you notice that rescuer had a life jacket on and he was all had a wetsuit. He really what he he he's good to go. If you're with a partner, I see what you're saying. If you, if, this guy wasn't aggressive at all. He was very passive. He was passive, but he's all—he's all—he's pretty rehearsed with this process. Yeah. Any of us fall in there, myself included, I'm going to be in a in a world of hurt and really scared. It's scary. I mean, I have fallen. It's it's awful. And I didn't watch this video prior to falling in. I didn't have a life jacket on. I didn't have spikes. I was completely unprepared. I was able to get out enough by hoisting myself up pretty quickly. But I, knowing this now, I would take my time, settle down. I was a mile and a half in on Hemlock Lake. Hemlock Lake's a lake with no houses. Not too many people have the second shot. No. So, but with that being said, I'd watch this at the beginning of every year, and I would, you know, try to follow his advice because he seems to know what he's doing. He's, he's volunteering his body to do it. Um, so, this, is, so obviously the Finger Lakes. This is where we are. Um, mainly this, uh, mainly I, I fish, uh, fish Canisius, Hemlock, Honey Oil, Canada Ice, all those lakes. And the reason I'm gonna, those are the lakes I highlight tonight, and and also Cuca. Because those are lakes that are kind of the shallowest, and those are lakes that have um, that are typically ice on them. Seneca, you're really not going to get ice on. Some of the other lake, some of these other lakes, you do, but they're a little bit farther travel for everybody. All the lakes I go over tonight will be within an hour driving range. Um, so when I go over them, the way I'm going to kind of go about it is what you can catch on them, and then it's like kind of things to be aware of. Because each of the lakes have some different access points, but with those access points, there's some common things you really do need to know about entering them. And like I said, hopefully we can get this in a form where you guys can get a hold of it. If not, I have forums at the end that share all, shares all this information as well. So Cuca Lake, the first one. The real access point on Cuca Lake would be the state park in Penn Yen. So everyone knows where the outlet is. There's a state park kind of on the other side of the outlet, and there's the address for it. But with that, that outlet is always running. They have the gates open all year long. So there's always current there. So there, it is really is varied ice um, thickness there. There's two sets of uh, lifeguard chairs there. I don't know if you can see it there, right there. You can see the picture. When I enter that, I walk my sled out past the second chair. And you're off people's property. It's kind of the beach. And you can follow that out, step out on, and then head out to the, head out to the lake, sputting the whole way. But that, right now, that's the first. If you drive up to Penyon, you'll see there's a sheet of ice going over that. But it's going to get dumped on with snow this weekend, so it's going to be Cuca's going to be hard to fish this year. So, Cuca Lake's a really, really good lake to fish for perch. Huge perch. The, the, the mirror is the perch you can get kind of out west. They're two pound perch. We got one last year. It was two and a half pounds. The average perch was between a pound and a pound and a pound and a half, which is pretty good fishing for perch in this area. Um, lake trout. There's a ton of lakers in there. If you're um, at Penyan, you can get out to 30 feet of water, and there's the lakers right now are just swarming in there because it baits. There's no saw bellies in the lake, so they're just hammering perch right now. So it's really good perch fishing and really good laker fishing. Um, Honey Oil Lake. So you, I, I kind of map quest it for you guys so you can see that. There's two access points on Honey Oil Lake, and that is typically around here the first lake that freezes, and that's a pretty popular lake. The south end is very. Um, there's a creek that comes in at the, at the launch at the south end, but it's really safe to walk out on. It's a set of buoys. You can kind of follow it out. And there's always people out there, so you'll see the tracks, but spud your way out there. And that's really good um, crappie fishing, perch fishing, some walleye in the lake. If you go to the north end, um, there's Trident Marina, 
and that's a really good spot to fish. If you can get off the north end, it's a little bit deeper water quicker, and you can get to the perch quicker there. However, there's a bubbler in that marina, and last year the fire department rescued two people. Basically, every year somebody's getting rescued out of Trident because they walk too close to them. It all looks the same, but the bubbler's eating at the ice underneath. So if you go to Trident Marine, that's where you'd want to kind of stay, stay to the right. So like I said, tri yeah, Trident has the bubbler, but right now, like tomorrow, that's where I'm, uh, for, uh, Saturday, that's where I'll be going is, is Honeywell Lake because it's safe ice. It's got at least four inches on it, and we have a couple cold nights, so that'll be a good spot to go, and I'll go out of Trident. Hemlock Lake. Um, Talk about beware first. The beware, that's the lake that has the runoff. That's the lake I, I went in on. And that's a beautiful lake. It really looks like a lake in the Adirondacks. As you can see, there's no houses around that. That's where Rochester um, gets a lot of its water from. Is the water plant is at the north end. Beautiful lake, really clean lake. Um, you're really not, if you have dogs on that lake, if you take dogs with you, they have to be on a leash. You will get ticketed. There's a little booth you need to stop at when you go there to, to sign up to go out in the lake. It's just basically said that you read over the rules of the lake. But once you get on it, it's, it's Decent fishing, they're a little harder to catch there for whatever the reason. I've just noticed that over the years, but it's a really beautiful lake to be on. There's perch, there's bass, there's walleye, there's lake trout. They stocked the walleye in that lake years ago, so there's not many walleye, but if you get them, they're, they're, they're pretty big. Um, beautiful lake to fish on, but the runoff is an issue in the spring. Canada Ice Lake is right up around in the same area um, as Hemlock Lake, another lake. With, there's more houses around that lake, but there's a lot of smelt in that lake that you can jig for, and that's not typical for this area. There's not many la lakes that have smelt in them anymore. Smelt? Smelt, yep. Well, we had smelt here years ago. You guys used to have smelt, used to have saw bellies too. And the bait and, the bait and saw cue. Sure, yeah. yeah, they both have kind of died off, yep. The smelt went first. Yeah, but that lake still has smelt. You can still jig for them there. Great. Yep. Would you say that Hemlock is the most popular one to go ice fishing on? No, Honeyway is. Honeyway is. Honeyway is. And you'll see that like, if you, uh, you can actually pull the webcam up of, of Honeyway Lake. If you, go, if you go home, like you go to Earth Cam Honeyway Lake, it'll be a webcam from the south end, and you'll see hut after hut after hut out there. There's just, there's hundreds of people out there. It's, it's unreal. I mean, like, to, on Saturday, it'll be a zoo there. Because it's, it's the first one to freeze around here. The Western New York is really hard to do ice fishing. It's just it's where the end of or middle middle of January and there's no ice. So if you pull up a web, it's really, it's pretty neat. Um, Canisius Lake uh, is another good lake, and that is one that typically freezes too. It's so shallow for so long, so that that is also a big panfish lake, a big pike lake. You can go there, and that's the, the forums are saying that that's starting to freeze too. So. The whole idea of this is to kind of give you the idea of basically uh, all the lakes within an hour of us that will freeze first. And your Honeyway is going to be your best option, and then Canisius, and then Candice Hemlock. Hemlock's pretty deep, so it takes a while to freeze. And then Bird's Eye Hollow, I don't know how many people are familiar with that, it's just the state park, um, like 15 minutes away from us. And that has bluegills in it and fish in it, and that should be frozen too. I don't fish Bird's Eye a lot, but I know a lot of people do. It's a pretty small lake. Honestly, I eat a lot of the fish I catch, and that lake, they it just it's kind of muddy and just they just don't t taste as good out of there, quite honestly. The, the next thing I really want to do is, is take some time and kind of go through all the different things. And a, as I do this, I'm going to kind of frame it in terms of like if you were to go to Field and Stream, how to get yourself set up to go because there is, it's overwhelming when you walk into one of those stores or you go online. So. I have a hut that I like to use. Like if you go out there, you're gonna need some sort of sled or some sort of hut. When it's cold out, I have a hut. I like the flip over huts. I didn't bring that in right now, but you don't need a hut. I fished for years without a hut, but it's a lot colder. You do need a sled though. You need something to get your gear out. And when you go to Field and Stream, they have a lot of different options for sled. I would get the sleds that have the um, bucket recession right in there. You can come up here later on and look. Or there's a little, like give it there that holds the bucket. That's huge for when you're pulling your sled long distances. And most of the places I go, all, all the places I listed, you have to go down some sort of embankment and up the other side, and your stuff falls all over the place unless you have it held in there well. So I, just so many options is no different in price. I'd get a sled like that. Um, and if you do have a hut, you're going to want that same ice screw. I have a whole, I mean, I take a whole bucket. I take my, I basically my ice fishing or my ice climbing bucket with me. Screw your hut down because the wind is, gets whipping on these lakes, and I've seen so many people's huts go blowing by me, and then it's gone. I mean, because there's a lot of these lakes have open water. It goes from ice to open water, and huts, huts go flying by a lot. So lock your hut down first. I mean, they, they go quick. Um, 
auger, you, you have two, a couple, you have tons of options on which ones to buy. At Field and Stream, right around here, they have uh, this, this one, the silver tip one, and it actually really is a, a, a really good auger for the price. They have two different options there. I honestly don't know what this one is compared to the other one. They look the same, but the more expensive option is the one I got because these the blades are angled a little bit differently, and it does make a difference drilling through. But with this, you kind of want to decide what type of fish you want to fish for. If you're going to be fishing for multi-species like lake trout and perch within your first year and you don't want to buy two different augers, I'd buy the 8-inch auger. This is a 6-inch auger, and I'm not going to take it off because the blade's pretty sharp, but th th this is the, literally the hole you have with that. So if you don't have the funds to buy two different augers, I would buy the bigger one because you're not going to fit many lake trout through that hole. And that can be pretty heartbreaking when you have a nice fish on and you watch, watching it bounce off the bottom of the hole. <laughs> Ask me how I know. Yeah. So the, um, but with that being said, if you do a lot of perch fishing, it's a lot quicker to drill in a six inch hole than it is an eight inch hole. And for perch fishing, you're drilling about 40 to 50 holes a day trying to follow the schools. And how long does it take to drill a hole? Or With this one, not like, uh, depends how thick the ice is. So uh, typically around here, it's six to eight inches. So I can do it in like eight, eight seconds. I mean, it goes, it goes really quick. It really does. It just shreds it up. But that's why it's worth spending a little bit extra money on the curved blades. And I, don't, I wish I knew the name of them. I, it's, it's this one. It's a silver tip. That one works really, really well. It really does. It goes through really, it goes like, just like butter. But you'll see guys out there that go through the ice, poke their, their auger through, take it out, and then set it down without shaking it off. As soon as you do that, you have ice that went over your blades, and then you'll see them go whack, 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 hit their blades against the ground, and you're watching those same guys later on trying to drill holes, and it's not going through, they just bent their blades. So I mean, treat it like a tool. I mean, it really is a tool. But when you're done with it, shake it off. And if you have to hit it, like you, you will get ice on it. I normally take something like this, and I just kind of work my way around it, take my time, and tap off the ice. Sounds really simple, but it, it makes a huge difference. And if you ruin your auger, the, the blades, the replacement plates for these are like $60. So you want to make sure that you kind of take good care of it. I've had, that, I've had those blades for, I think I'm going, I'm going to my third year and I, I drill a lot of holes. And when you're perch fishing, you really are, you're chasing the school, you're chasing the school all day long. So you're drilling holes, drilling holes, drilling holes. So recap. 8 inch if you're going to do both and you don't want to spend both, 6 inch if you're going to go directly for perch and panfish and you're going to drill a lot of holes, that they, they go pretty quick. Um, I'll go more into the tip up in the rods in a, in a minute. A lot of guys, out on the ice around here, I, I, it always concerns me because when I'm out there there's garbage all over the place. Ice fishing has kind of turned into a party out on the ice. You have guys bringing, you know, going out there to drink beer and eat chips all day long and their beer cans are blown by and their chips are blown by. I don't care what, you, you know, if, if you're going to go out there, if you could just respect the idea of taking a trash bag with you and put your stuff in the bag because the access points are becoming more and more limited in the area because people are getting more and more tired of garbage blowing up on their lawns a lot. Some of the access points like on Loon Lake around here is through a, um, through a uh, restaurant. But the restaurant, I was on the forum the other day, the restaurant, there were guys that were arguing with the restaurant owner. Just some things that are happening that aren't very bright for the, for the area we have and for the limited access we have. So, you know, I'll, I'll go to the trash bag. Just, if you would bring, you bring something to put your trash in and make sure you keep the ice clean. And then bring a bottle to use the restroom in too because you wouldn't believe how many people are out on the ice. Yeah, it's, it's a, it, it can be a circus out there sometimes. Um, I, for the rods, when you, when you go to Field and Stream, I don't know if, if anybody has gone to field and stream and kind of seen the setup. There's rods all over the place. You go on and on, there's rods all over the place. There really are specific rods for the type of fishing you're going to do. If you're going to do trout fishing, and Cuca Lake is a wonderful lake to do trout fishing in, you really want, there's kind of, it goes from ultra light to medium to medium heavy rods. You really kind of want a medium heavy rod, and I'll show you the difference with the tips, and I'll pass them around. Some of the ones I'm going to pass around are going to have hooks on them, but you, for trout, you want something that's sturdy enough to get them up through the hole. And if you look at that, that's pretty, you know, it takes quite a bit to bend that. And the rigging for that really is pretty specific because if you're down over 30 feet, monofilament and fluorocarbon has a lot of stretch. So you're not going to feel your hit. So what I always do is I do a backing of some sort of braid. So I'll pull this out a second. I'll show you what it is. That you see the braids are a completely different color. That's basically like a like a cotton line, there's zero stretch in that. 
So when you're fishing for them and you're down that deep, you can really see the hits and you can also drive the hook home when they do hit. So that makes it so it's a nice setup. And there's knots I'll go over at the end of this, but for lake trout, that's really what you want. You want braid going to, um, I use a floor, so there's when you go to the store, you'll see fluorocarbon, you'll see monofilament. Fluorocarbon is completely invisible in the water. And these lakes all around here are gin clear because of the zebra mussels. So you won't, you won't, you really won't catch much on monofilament. The fish can see it. The fluorocarbon is completely invisible. So it's just, it's way more expensive, but it's, your, your, your productivity is just way better. You, I've, I've fished side by side with people that are using monofilament compared to the fluorocarbon. I outfish them like crazy. I mean, it's just, it's very noticeable. With that also, you know, there's different pound tests that you can use. I would rather set my drag lighter and use a lighter test than try to, try, you know, try to beef up to anything above eight pound test. And a lot of times for, for Lakers in this lake during the ice, I'll go down to six pound test and if they're picky, I'll go to four pound test. So you're better off setting your drag on your, on your um, reel and setting and, and not breaking your line that way so they don't see it so you have more hits. But I'll, I'm gonna pass these around just so you can kinda, you're not gonna mess them up, you can feel them. And then on this too, you can kinda just play with the drag. And, but you could, you know, really bend the tip, feel, feel, you know, see what it feels like, and then. And then also for, um, for lake trout, one of the main setups on this lake, it really won tons of tournaments with this setup. A one ounce jig, and one ounce jig is a heavy, heavy jig for that rod. It really is, it's a big ball jig. And then a white tube. And you just feed the jig on the tube, and that really works really, really well. On this, you'll notice also, if I get, um, on the bottom of it, there is a, you can take it right off and kind of just leave it right off. There's a snap swivel. That's really important because that it, it actually swivels. So when you're down that deep and you're reeling that jig up, it's continually turning as you reel. If you don't have that swivel on there, your line's continually turning, and it will break as the day goes on. So the swivel is a huge piece of that. And you'll notice I use a pretty small swivel for that. All that stuff can be purchased at the store and there's, no, there's really not a magic formula for it. You, you just need braid to fluorocarbon to swivel to some sort of heavy jig. And that, that really works. It, it works really well. The technique for lake trout fishing, it kind of depends how deep you are. If, you're, if, if it freezes up in Brantsport and Lakers this time of year, they all head north in that lake. For whatever the reason, they really head, they seem to be piled in, uh, up north. They do a lot of winter trolling too. I don't mark anything in Hammondsport, at least I haven't for the last couple of years as the winter goes on. As soon as you get up to Brantsport, your screen is just lit up with Lakers. So on Brantsport side, it's really, really deep. The access point I gave you wasn't Brantsport, that was Penyan. Brantsport has a state park too. I don't anticipate it freezing this year, but if it does freeze in years to come, great lake trout fishing and it's so much fun. Because the technique for deep water lake trout fishing is you drop the dig to the bottom, you bounce bottom twice, and you reel in 160 feet of water all the way back up to the surface. And they will just come pile driving it and they'll do, they hit it. It's so much fun. And if you have electronics, it's, uh, I'll go over that later on, it's like video game fishing. It is so much fun. So that's, that's kind of deep water lake trout fishing. Shallow, I don't use that setup for lake trout. I literally use my perch pole and I actually try to stay away from the lake trout, but it's almost impossible. So if I get bored and I want to catch something, I try to catch lake trout on four pound test and it takes forever to get it in. And I'll go over that in a minute, but it, it, the shallow of the water, the, the, the finer the presentation you want. You want something a lot smaller, something a lot, a lot less cumbersome. That's huge. I mean, that's a huge, the, the setup looks like that. It looks like a giant bait fish. So I'll go over how to catch lake trout in shallow water here in a minute. So perch, crappie, sunfish, bluegills, all of those kind of follow a similar setup. I have two different poles I use for that. If they're super aggressive, which this time of year, the beginning of the year, they really, they are. And I, I use a pole like this, and you'll notice a difference in this tip. I mean, that is like, it's like a spring. It's like really loose and really tiny. And I use no backing, I do straight fluorocarbon, but it's two pound test. So two pound test, but you see I'm pulling on that pretty hard, that pole, you know, really takes a lot of the brunt of the hit. And then you have your drag you can also play with on your reel to loosen it up. Um, but with that, like I said, you know, ultra, ultra light rod, fluorocarbon line, 
And I use, um, when you go to the store, the, like within the last five years, Tunks and Jigs have come out. And they're really, really nice because they're, they're quite a bit smaller profile, but they're heavy. So you can get down to the fish quick, but not have to use a big lure to get down to them. Like they're, 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 they're I don't know if they're twice as heavy as lead. I'm, I'm sure it's something out there will tell you, but it's, you know, they're, they're, they're quite a bit noticeably more heavy than lead. So you can have a really small presentation. So the Penyan area, like I said, it's 15 to 30 feet. I'm using really tiny stuff and really, really finesse fishing. Like I drive my wife crazy because I, it really is what you, it, it, it's, it, it's the look of the jig that's going to catch the fish. So I'll, pr I'll literally practice at home. A lot of people think ice fish jigging is like, you know, you'll see guys out there, they're like stroke in the pole. They're not going to catch anything. In this clear, clear water, you really got to be finesse with them. You know, you just, you have it just sitting there and I just go like that. It's literally just tap, tap, tap. Tap, tap, tap. And a lot of times I'm just watching the very tip of my pole for the slightest little, you know, you'll just see the slightest little bend or you'll even see a raise hit. The fish will just come up. And their metabolism is so low, right? They're, 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 they're cold, so they're not really aggressive. They'll come in, they'll just, and they'll bump the tip of the pole up, and that's when you can set the hook. Um, so I don't fish just a straight jig. Um, there's bait shops around here, run right in Penyan, right, at, right by the, um, the Beverage Baron, I think it's called. It has wax worms and spikes there. They're just like a little grub. They look like this. They're kind of gross. If, if you know, you got to keep them in your fridge at home. <laughs> you're, uh, you're, you're <laughs> again, you know, that's, you can play that by ear. But I, I keep them in the fridge because I have a pretty warm house. And if, you, if they, they'll, they'll, they'll hatch, they'll literally hatch. So I keep them inside a Yeti cup because the Yeti cups are super insulated, I keep them in my fridge and they last, they last for a long time. And you just bait like one or two on your hook. And this is like somewhat technical, but I, I typically do a wax worm and then a spike. These spikes have a little more dexterity to them, but the wax worms seem to catch more. Schools of fish come in, so you want to get right back down there. So if you can have that where you don't have to keep rebaiting every two seconds, remember your hands aren't like they are inside, you're freezing cold. So, so you could fall in and you're freezing cold. Who's excited about ice fishing, right? <laughs> so you, you, the, the quicker you get down there, the better off you're gonna be. So I normally go waxworm to spike and you'll be able to tell the difference when you buy them. The waxworm, the spikes are pretty kind of hard and they stay on there quite well. Or I'll go waxworm to some sort of, like I'll take a plastic rub and I'll just cut a little piece off it and put it on there to hold it on there. Because when they come through, your kind of catch time is limited. And I like to load up, as, you know, catch as many as you can before they go away. We have to go drill more holes to find them. Um, so both of these rods are my, like, perch rods. As the season goes on, it gets, they get very, it gets beat up out there. You got guys with gas augers drilling 6,000 holes and it's just all day long. The noise is unreal, it just radiates through the ice. So they get very, very picky. So then they really start hitting light. When they hit really, really light, you know, you can buy the, pole. there's lots of poles out there, but I just use the same pole or a similar pole and I buy um, a spring bobber for it, a titanium spring bobber. The titanium, I think they're like $5 more for the titanium ones rather than like the stainless ones, but they last forever. They, like you really can't break the titanium. But if you just look at that, I'll pass this one around too, I apologize. But if you, when, when this comes around, if you, uh, and just feel the tip of that. If you just look at that top of that, it, it really is really, really, really wobbly. I don't know how to say it. You feed, your, you feed your lure through that, and then you really can detect any little movement. And I don't wear, I actually wear my glasses out on the ice. I mean, these poles are like, I don't think they're, they're, they're no more than 30 inches long. And I have to laser focus my eyes in on what's happening with the jig. So when you get that through there, you'll notice with these, what that jig does to that. So bent over that is, you can adjust it by push, pushing it back through. But I normally get it like that. And then, I, you know, like I said, I'll literally practice on the couch. And when I'm ice fishing, I'll keep my hand like this. So there's absolutely no, and the, it, when the jig's in the water, obviously it's not gonna be swinging like that. There's absolutely no movement on it. And I'll just slowly raise it. And that's the only way I can get them to bite as the year goes on. But you'll see people saying, they read the forums, the fishing was horrible today. It's, the fish are there, they have to eat. And you just have to adjust your technique and you have to really go a lot slower. And all these things kind of help. So if I was to go and I was to try to get myself set up for the year around here, I would buy two poles and you can get them for $30. I'd buy a pole that has, you know, medium to medium heavy for lake trout if you want to play with those. And then 
some sort of ultralight pole, and then a spring tip bobber, and you can have a complete setup for like $60. So it'll get you both types of, both types of fish, and then you just, just work the technique along with that. Now, you, you're talking about lake trout. Do you ever see rainbows or anything else? Not on Cuca as much. Um, more towards the the south end. There's the there's the um, inlet that's in the south end, Colebrook. They tried to restore the population of rainbows and, and browns. Uh, I think they they've been doing it for five or six years. They just stopped doing it though because the sawbellies crashed. So do I see them? I do a lot of trolling on that lake, and I've caught two. I mean, I, I, thousands of hours of trolling. I do a lot of fishing on that lake, and, and it's, there's not many rainbows or browns in that lake. The browns are kind of coming back, but I guess what I'm trolling for, too, the speed is different, so I'm not really set up to catch them all that well, but you don't see a lot of guys catching them, no. And especially in Penyon, you will not catch them. It's just too shallow. It's, just, it's like a dish pan in Penyon. It goes like, you know, where Hammondsport's like this, it drops off, you know, pretty precipitously. It just goes like that. Penyon's a dish pan. It just goes like this forever. That's why it's such good perch fishing. They like those flat, those shallow flats. But uh, Honeyway, and not Honeyway, Hemlock, there's browns and rainbows in that lake. And you have more of a chance of catching them there. Um, I'm going to skip ahead in the presentation and I'll go back. This is not a cheap piece of equipment, but it will, it will increase your catch rate times a thousand. It's unreal. I mean, these, these machines are called Vexlars. They are really pretty, they're, they're really nice ways to see what's going on under the water. You learn so much how to fish and how fish behave. You can, re what this is, is this is, there's two different types of like underwater visuals you can get. You can get like a regular depth sounder that kind of is the screen that passes across and you see the little arcs on there and the screen keeps moving across. This is live time. So when you turn this on, it's spinning lines and, and, and you put the cone down in the water and when you drop your jig down, you see your jig on the screen and then you see the fish rise up to your jig on the screen. So then you can really start to hone in. You're like when I'm doing that and I'm acting like that, I don't sit there all day long. That'd be so boring with my finger on my rod tip. I'm waiting till a fish comes in. Sometimes I'll do a little bit more, but when it comes in, then I know I gotta, I start to adjust my presentation. These are unreal. You, I, you know, you can, I would, if I went ice fishing and I went and I forgot this at home and I was an hour away, I'd turn back around, I'd go get it and go back because you're going to catch so many more fish. I do want to show you guys how those work. And then I'll go kind of into tip ups and stuff. There it is really pretty cool. Let's take you out on the ice and get a first hand look at how the FL18 will help you catch more fish. Hi, I'm Dave Gantz. Today we're going to do some jumbo perch fishing. But first, I'd like to thank you for purchasing the I Vexilar I'm not FL18, any of this stuff. the most advanced fishing electronics on the market today. It's unreal, though. During our fishing, we will show you the normal operation and the features that make it so special. So let's start ice fishing. This guy's like the man in ice fishing. Like Michael Jordan basketball I think a while ago. This guy's like the ice fishing guy. Before we get down to the serious stuff of catching a few fish, we're going to talk a little bit about your FL-18. This is the ice deucer. It hangs in the hole and sends and receives the signal. It's a very important part of your unit and it needs to be taken care of or drag it across the ice or bang it on the floor of your fish house. As you're rolling this down the hole, you'll see there's a lot of surface clutter. To get rid of that, we need to get the transducer to the bottom of the ice. It's set up on a float system here that just slides back and forth on the cord. It has a stopper to, to stop it to only go down so far. So set the stopper to the length of the ice. Today here we have about three feet of ice. So we got the stopper about three feet up the floor. Like three inches. No, as we lower this into the water, you'll see the surface clutter on the top of the unit. As we lower it down and, and get the float to the water, the surface clutter blows away. That's how you should properly set up your ice deucer with your FL-18. Now that we have the transducer in the water, we're gonna set the mode and the depth range. We have two choices on the, on the mode range. It's low power and normal. The low power up application is for less than 15 feet. Today we're going to use a normal application, which is the 20 foot scale on the dial, the white letters. We're going to turn it on to the 1x scale, which is reading the 20 foot scale on your dial. 
the white letters. And you'll see that it's reading nothing, so we'll go to the times two, which is the 40-foot scale. We also have a times three, times four, and a times 10. But today, since we're in about 30 feet of water, we will use the 2x scale. And you'll see that the unit is reading about 30 feet. So when it does that, yeah, that, fish are feeding on these you'll see the bottom, of, and when you watch this so guy drop it down, and this really is how you can learn a ton about fishing, on, the, the single best piece of equipment you can get. Action. These fish are belching up minnows, so that's why we're fishing with minnows today. So it's very easy, that's all we're doing, is just hooking it on there like that and dropping it down, and then big perch are coming up there and just whacking it. Okay, here we are, we're gonna set the game now, but remember, we're in a normal setting and a range mode of two. And now we're gonna set the gain so that we can watch our lure sink to the bottom. Get it? Start to lure down the hole, we're gonna turn so up the gain. So it's live time, you literally so watch it go down. down. This is where I was see saying video game fishing? That's my, that's my lure that I just dropped you down. Now that's how much power I wanna give it. I don't wanna overpower it. <laughs> that's fish, those are fish. Clutter in there. So, so those are the perch that come up and that's when you can really figure so out what you're doing. So that I can see doing. my lure clearly going down on the, the, the screen or on the dial. And they're super aggressive, yeah. He's gonna I'll get it down to the bottom. Now you see I have some fish down there. Here's a fish kind of up off the bottom there. I've got my lure right in front of that fish. <laughs> it's, it, it, it's almost like cheating. And he bit. <laughs> so you don't need to watch six hours just like catching fish, but you know the fish that's the basic there. idea. Those are all fish, fish down there right those now. are your lures, but that thing has changed the game for both summer fishing and winter fishing for me because you can really then, then you can understand what's going on below the ice. Um, and I, I used to do a lot of tip up fishing and a lot of tip down fishing. Ever since I got one of those, it, it's a, I, I don't want to do anything else. Yeah. So you just drill a bunch of holes first and I do. I get follow the, around with that. I do, so hold the hole. yeah, like I, I'm pretty specific. I, I get there really, really, really early. And because the, the, the perch typically don't start biting like on, on Cuca Lake until about 7, 7.15 in the winter. So I get there like at 5 o'clock and I go get my whole area set up. So I'm not making any noise. That's why I love when like at 8 o'clock all the guys come out with their electric thing. <laughs> yeah, I love that. But anyway, I get, I get my whole area set up because it is. It's, you're, 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 they're right under you. I mean, so I go get it set up and I kind of know the spots where they are. And then I'll go with that. And I'll go put it in the hole and I'll go, you know, I'll go, I'll go check out what's going on there and go see if they're there. And then if they are, you pound them there for an hour and then, they, they, then the, school, the whole school moves. So then I go try to find some of my other holes. Okay. Now, I'm not saying you can't drill a hole. I drill holes all day long and catch fish, but I do like to, have, I do like to get there early and like to have my area set up. So do you have to drill your holes like 20 feet apart? Uh, it, it, it depends. So I've, I've, you know, we've, I, I go with my brother-in-law a lot and I'll be, you know, either I'll be catching or he'll be catching 10 feet apart from each other. Because the bottom of the lake, like perch really like, they, they love those long dish pan bowls of a lake. And it's like two miles of that there. But within those, there are little humps. And it can make a huge difference if you're up, if you're up six inches compared to right on the bottom where, 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 where your partner could be. So you do have to move around a lot. But they'll come into you too. So if I go to a hole, like I don't just give up on the hole as soon as I, I I'll, I'll, I'll put that spoon on and I'll bang the bottom like crazy too. Get it muddy down there and try to get like, worm, you know, try to get whatever grubs they're eating on the bottom up to start, you know, this, this, the, the grubs to kind of rise up. So I beat the bottom up with my lure, beat it up, beat it up, beat it up, beat it up, and then wait, beat it up, beat it, and, then, and then you'll start to see stuff come in, and then, you know, and then you'll know the, the quality of them because they, they, they kind of hang in similar size schools. Small fish hang with small fish, big fish hang with big fish. So I'm catching small fish, I'm like, okay, well, that's, let me go someplace else. Another deadly technique for perch is when you get a nice one, keep it on for like 30 seconds under the hole. They are so competitive. So if you have it on, I just let it swim around, just and then I'll have my buddy drill a hole right next to me while that's swimming around. Like, get, come on over because we're going to start catching for a while. And then you can drop your stuff down and catch. So, it, you know, it is electronics are a huge cheat with it. It helps so, so much. You don't need them. The same principles apply. It's just more fun to look at it. But when you find a school, the school's typically there. If they're not there and it's been 15, 20 minutes, move. You don't need to sit there all day long and try to catch because they're not, they're not going to come in if they haven't, you know. They will maybe, but you're going to waste a lot of your day. So I'm always moving. That's why I like the six inch auger instead of the eight inch auger. In a typical day, I probably drill 50 holes. You know, but I spend a pretty good portion of time out there too. So I'm, I'm sun up to some down. So I mean, it, 50 holes isn't that many in that duration of time. 
but I'll get there like yes in the morning and I'll get my area set up with 10 holes around me. And I, t I try to do it in some sort of logical manner, like a straight line this way, a straight line, you know, like I try to kind of narrow in a section to figure out what's happening on the bottom. And then I, my, my phone, I have a GPS app on my phone that's awesome. Like you can, you don't you need to buy some fancy GPS system. I, I can tell you the name of the app. It's uh, um, Fishing Points, ironically. But it's really, it's not going to load in here probably, but what I'll do is then when I catch fish the week that, that week, I start marking my points and then I kind of have some sort of an idea where to go out the next time and, and get set up because the, it really the contour of the bottom makes a huge difference and they um, typically go back to those areas. And there's like a lot, there's like small tournaments you can do on the lakes and stuff, so it's nice going into the tournament with a game plan. So, the, you know, that's a lot of fun. I still do do tip-up fishing once in a while, and this can be a lot of fun too, and this is a great way to get into it. It's a great way to get kids out there and get into it because it kind of gives everybody something to do. Taking a kid fishing and the ice fishing can, can be brutal. I've, you know, I've taken younger kids fishing. It's cold, your stuff locks up, it can be a mess. Tip-up fishing, everybody can be involved, and it's not a lot of setup. But there are some, I'll just get, kind of get to the page I can talk off it. Oops. It's probably brutal watching me try to navigate um, PowerPoint. I apologize for that. <laughs> so with tip-ups, um, you know, if you're, it, there, there's kind of two different setups, much like perch. If I'm going for lake trout, like on Hemlock Lake, You'll notice I have a huge sinker on there. Same deal, fluorocarbon leader. Um, with tip-ups, I kind of size up. You know, I'll go eight to 10 pound for, for a trout. But I do a pretty decent size, yep, there it goes. A pretty decent size leader. And then at the end of the leader, you'll notice um, I do like a beads and a weight and then a swivel again. Because with your tip-up fishing, you're always doing live bait minnows. So you hook the minnow on the bottom of that if you have a Vexlar, you can l turn that on, lower your line down to it, and watch your line go. Give it some time to straighten out, and you can get, your, get it right, kind of like right next to bottom. And that's typically where, you, where the lake trout will hang. A lot of fish will hang kind of like, closer to the bottom, within the, like five feet from the bottom. You'll, there's always action going on down there. So you, wanna, you don't want your, 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 your jig resting on bottom. Not a lot of people, are, you know, first year are going to go out and buy a Vexlar. If that's the case, I'd, get, I'd have some sort of jigging rod with um, you know, some way to, you, you, can me you, you see people measure with, with line, like they'll drop the line down, they'll pace it up, and then they'll pace their line down kind of like the same amount. But that is not all that technical. And that, that, you, a lot of guys, your stuff's laying on bottom, and you'll know it when you pick it up at the end of the day because weed, you know, it's just full of weeds. So you want to get above the weed line. When you do find the right depth, and that can take like 10 minutes, and a lot of work. I always put a button on mine, so that way when I catch a fish, I'm not starting back at square one. I can put the button where I left off. I'm not gonna go all the way down to it. That's where I left off last time, but the button's there so you can slide the button to where it is so you know the exact depth every time. So you, when you reset, you put your, put your lure down there, it's going right back to where you just caught that fish. So, and typically when you catch a fish on these, you're not, you're not sitting there reeling it up like this. You're actually hand lining it in. So, you know, a lot of people get super excited when the flag pops and they run right over, they try to set the hook. I let the fish take it for at least 30 seconds to a minute. Let them take it, let the flag be up. You'll hear your line, it's, it's, it's awesome. It's like zzz, zzz, zzz. They're taking it, they're running with it. But sometimes they don't have it all in their mouth. So I let them run and they'll, sometimes they'll stop running, sometimes they won't, but let them eat it. And then you want to give the line a good pop and then you want to hand line them in. So could you? Yep, absolutely. Yeah, so. Let me kind of, let me let me kind of let me yeah can I get this reeled back up and I can show you when I get I got to get it kind of set. So you know you can't create a better mouse trap, but everyone's always trying. This is the better mouse the, 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 the attempt at the better mouse trap for a chip up, and I'll show you the other tip up. The old school tip ups really are sometimes really the best. So that goes in there like that. Okay, so you get the depth of line you want. You have it paced out. Like I said, I don't know. Think, I don't think I explained that all that well. Pacing the line out, the way the way to do that, like you said, you can. It's okay. I'm good now. You have you have the the, the 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 test line out. Lay it out. Lay this out. Pull your button down to it. Reel it back up. And then lower it down the hole. So that way you know the depth. So then when you have that, then you have this and your flag's up. Jesus, your weight's down there. Your flag's up. This is what's going to stop that from spinning. As soon as I put that on there, that won't spin anymore. And then when the fish takes it, it's going to turn that spool. And that's when the flag's going to pop up. 
So a lot of times you get wind flags, which on a boring day, it's heartbreaking. You go over there, nothing's going on. But uh, yeah, so it's, it's literally, it's just that turns that, which is connected to this, and boof, pops up. Let them run, let them take it, and then reel them in. And when you reel them in, you're literally like, I, I take it, I normally set it off to the side, let them take it, let them take it, and I give them a good pop, and then I just hand line it in. But when you're hand lining in, I'm, I'm pretty deliberate about how I keep my line. I keep, I, I kind of pace it so it's not going to be a giant knot, you know, because it's, it's <laughs> so much easier in the house, it's cold out, you know, your hand, nothing works as well. Um, can you just reel that up, Dad? I can show the other one. Thank you. Do you wear special gloves? You know, this is going to sound weird. I actually don't wear any gloves because with it, you're, just like the body goes through shock, <laughs> your hands are super cold at first. My hands are always really bad in the winter. But I, I, I fish a lot outside, and then I, I'll go in the hut. But it's, it's so much. I can't work with the gloves on. I have a really hard time um, like feeling, feeling the rod, feeling the hits. So the, a lot of the winter gloves are big and bulky. And if you're trying to rebate and the fish come in, like I was saying, it's really important with a lot of the, like with the perch and with the crappie to get down there when they're down there. If you have gloves on, you really can't rebate your stuff as quickly because your gloves, I've tried it. I mean, like I'd love to have a glove, but as soon as you try to get the, 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 through the wax worm again, you're, you're poking into your glove. It's really, you know, you're, I'm dealing with the hook sizes are so, so small. So I have big, big giant mittens that when I'm getting really, really cold, I'll put one hand in the mitten, let it warm up and then just keep fishing and then kind of switch hands out. But it's, I mean, it, the huts are kind of nice because you have a heater in them and you can, uh, yeah, you can stay a lot warmer. But you don't catch as much in a hut because you're not moving around as much. You're not following. So it's, it, once you get your hut set up, you have your ice screw in. In order to move, you got to pick your ice screw out. You got to go take your hut. You got to move. So I do most of my, I have the hut to warm up in and then I do a lot of my fishing outside. So that's that tip up. And with the tip ups, with any of it, the skimmer is kind of important because after you drill the hole, it looks like a slushy in there, you know, there's tons of ice chunks. You gotta kind of keep the hole clean. With the tip ups, it's really, really important. You have that hole and you have a whole block of ice around it that the hole will freeze up a ton throughout the day. So you have to go and keep kind of poking at your hole because you'll break your tip ups. I've broken tip ups before because I kind of gotten lazy, haven't you? Know, you're allowed 15 tip ups. That's a lot of work. So you have your 15 tip ups out. If you don't clean up after them, you don't keep the holes clean. You freeze 15 tip ups in the water. You got a lot of pickup to do, and you're, 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 you know you can build like you can build four inches of ice in a day if it's super cold out, especially in a hole that, that that's that big that's full of ice around it. So you know I, the back. That's why this thing's all beat up. You know I, I go by and I just whack smack the hole just to make sure to keep it. You know walk around smack the hole smack the hole. But you know that's nice to have one of those. Um, same principle, no different. Other tip up. Um, you can tip up, you don't have to tip up fish for lake trout. You can do it for, you know, the smaller species too, perch. And that's also kind of a nice way to find perch. So like you were saying, if I get there early and if I don't know the area really well, like I know Cuca pretty well, and that's the main lake I fish because it's got great perch in it. But if I don't know a lake, I'll set some tip ups out to see if I can locate a school. And it's just, I'll size down with that again to four, two to four pound test. And it's a little heavier line because I'm putting live, I'm putting a minnow on there. It's moving around a lot, and it could get caught in the weeds. And you're pulling, you know, if you pull out, you know, anything under two, you pull that through the weeds, you're going to break it. But you know, same deal. That you let it out to where you want it, and then this has kind of a little catch on it right there. The flag goes around like that, and <laughs> you got to watch your face with these because the wind will plop them and you're, you're, you're literally, when you're putting it in the hole, what's right there? I mean, it's, I've done it so many times, so just turn it that way. <laughs> and I, and I, I mean, I, I'm saying that, I do it every, I mean, I, you, you get, you, it hurts. <laughs> you watch, that's, that's, it's like, a, it, it, it'll, it'll catch your attention. And when you're cold, everything stings more. So yeah, that was, that's, that's basically, that is the basic tip up. And that's a great way to get into it too. It really is. And you can, you can catch a ton of fish with tip ups. When you put your hook away, don't bury your hook in your cotton line because the hook has a barb on the other end. So I just literally just touch it in there. You don't need much. If you buried it in there, then when you're trying to get it back out in the middle of the ice, you have 15 tip ups with every barb is buried. Little things, but it makes a huge difference when you're freezing cold. Um, when you're hooking the minnow for the tip ups, there's like kind of a couple different ways you can hook them. 
there'd basically be two different types of minnows you're able to get around here. They're called fatheads. They're like really tiny minnows like that. And then there's like bass minnows, they call them. They're really not bass, but they call them bass minnows. Typically, people use them for bass fishing. The fatheads, you really want to hook. The smaller minnow, you want to hook kind of through either the front lip like that, but I don't even like to do that. I like to hook them both, like kind of right through the, sounds gross, sorry, Aubrey, right through the eyes because they don't, you pin the mouth shut, they're not breathing, they're not going to move as much. Right, you, you pin them through the eyes and they, they, they swim a little bit more freely. The bass minnows I like to hook in the back because they're a bigger minnow, they can take it and they, they're moving around a lot. Sometimes I'll flick the minnow a couple times because the metabolism everything as the winter goes on slows down. So you don't want something that's zoom, zoom, like zooming around. If you get it kind of twitching down there, so I, I kind of like to get them so they're not really moving a lot it, late winter, moving more early winter, but just twitching late winter, and they just kind of sit there and they hover, and that's when you get more hits. So that's kind of, the, the, you know, that's mm -hmm. basics of, of, you know, from safety to uh, jigging to tip-ups. And, you know, the more advanced, I'd get a Vexlar because that will definitely increase your catch rate. And it'll just make you a better fisherman in terms of um, what's going on down there and knowing you don't have to, you know, when you go out there, you'll see people just like stroke and they're not going to catch anything. <laughs> and if they do catch it, it's going to be a pickerel, you know, and the pickerel, you'll catch those two. I didn't mention those because honestly, I try to stay away from them because they just mess your line up. As soon as you get pickerel's mouth are full of teeth, they're not really good to eat. They're really hard to clean. So questions, I guess, would be the the way I would end is anybody have any questions on? Just with the, the terminology of the fish, I spent some time in Wisconsin and they have northerns and walleye. Mm -hmm. So what's pike and? So around here, a pickerel is not a not a northern. A pickerel is like a breed of a northern, just like a perch is in a pickerel. It's kind of, or a perch is in a pike. It, they're a stiff, They're a different strand. They're not a game like the the pike are game fish. Pickerel aren't grain fish, they're like a crossbreed of something. I don't know what the other side of them are, but they're just, they're, they're smaller, super, look just, look very similar to the pike. They don't have that chain along them, but like I, this lake is full of them. I don't know why there's so many in this lake. They're a warm water species, they have same habitat, same idea, same, you know, same diet, but they just, they're everywhere and they, you know, I do a lot of bass fishing too. They just ruin, it's hard to keep them off your line. You try to stay away from them and walleye, are different than both those species. There's no walleye in Cuca Lake. Um, like I said, there's a few in Hemlock Lake. They stocked them in the 70s. We caught one, you know, a couple of years ago. It was huge. It was like, it was like nine pounds, which is that's a giant walleye for this area. Um, but there's not many areas around here that have walleye. Canisius has them, but there's people don't have a lot of a lot of luck catching them in the winter for whatever the reason in that lake. So this really isn't a good walleye area, quite honestly. Pickerel are fun to catch. Like you'll see people out there with bags of pickerel. I mean, they they can, they can be fun to catch. I, I just assume not because it ruins. I'm, it's not the fish I'm targeting. If, what, are, what are you gonna do with them? Oh, well, you can't. I mean, you can, I, people eat them, but I, I I I clean a lot of fish. I clean a lot of fish, and you think pike are bony? Pickerel are even worse. There's no meat on them. I mean, you're just <laughs> not not not. Yeah, I, I have little little no interest in pickerel. Yeah. Um. So when you fish. Uh, up to sundown, how many fish do you get? So you're allowed to keep 50 perch, you're allowed to keep five lake trout. I, I, I don't really enjoy cleaning 50 perch, it's a lot of perch to clean, so I'll just keep like a dinner, but I, I just enjoy, I just love it. I mean, I, I enjoy it, it's what I love to do. It's like I spend all my free time fishing, so I'll keep, I don't keep them every time either. Like the bigger perch, I actually put back in the lake because the bigger ones have, have the, they're, they're the good breeders, they're the ones that get the bigger population of perch. So I'll keep like the perch that are like, you know, like that, you know, not, not even a pound. Anything above a pound, I try to throw back. I mean, I'll keep them once in a while, but, you know, the, the, the 15 fish will, 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 will feed my wife and I for two days. You know, that's plenty. Perch. So you what? Like fish. Yeah. Okay. You got to cook it right. You got to cook it right. Um, <laughs> if, if you catch lake trout, yeah. lake trout really are really good, and the, the ecosystem of the lake has changed that we before they were eating smelt, not smelt, they were eating smelt long ago, but they were eating saw bellies. Both of those, smelt and saw bellies, are pretty oily. The Lakers have a bad reputation of tasting oily, but now that they switched over to more of more of like the gobies on the bottom and some of the other uh, some of the other fish in the perch. They're stocking with Cisco now. They're stocking with Cisco, but even prior to that, so I, I have yet to eat a Laker 
since the stocking of the Cisco's. But I real, real soon. Real soon. Okay. Yeah, they should be, and, and they've been. I've heard they have been just pounding the Cisco's. I don't anticipate the Cisco's going to be there for too long, but maybe they will. But the Lakers, the meat changed from white to pink. It's crazy. Like when you clean them now, they're, they're, they're inside, mo the inside of a lot of them are pink. They're delicious now. Mm. Yep, they're really, really good. The cold water fish taste better than the warm water fish? Uh, no, the perch are the best tasting fish. Like if you look up, the, I have an ice fishing magazine. I should have brought it. Right now, perch is selling more from, than filet fin, mignon. It's. But like the fish, they say they're more firmer in the. They are. They are like, yeah, I, I, I didn't know if you meant species like, so yeah, like right now is the best, like in the winter, yeah, everything tastes so much better. Oh, so much better. It's unreal. Yeah, really, really good. And they just keep that, you know, like you're out on the ice, you can, a lot of people, and I, they, they say to fill a bucket with water and put the fish in the water, but you really can put the fish on the ice by the time you get home and clean them. But the only problem is if you get them completely frozen, they're really hard to clean. So you want to kind of keep, a happy medium of that, you know, if you, if you have a bucket, you can put some water, scoop some water in it and keep them in there and kind of keep changing the water as the day goes on. Or if you're not going to spend a full day out there and they're not going to completely freeze, just put them on the ice. How do you prepare the perch? So I, I typically fry them. I, I, I cut them up and then I just do an Old Bay seasoning and panko crumbs. And they're so good. I mean, they really are. They're, they're, it's, it is the best fish. They're delicious. When you clean a perch, you clean it. They're, they're one of the easier fish to clean because they only have a rib cage. So you just, it's just basic flay. You flip it and you, you, you know, flay it out, you flip it over, you take the skin off and it's just one little cut around the ribs. So that can like process, you know, 20 fish in like, you know, 15 minutes. It's, you can go pretty quick with it. And it's, they're, they're delicious. Lake trout on the other hand, when you clean them, uh, they have uh, like a bone that runs, you, have, you know, you have, the, you have from their, their gills back, it runs almost to like their halfway to their tail. So you have to take that center bone, that center bone out. And there are people that are good at V cutting it out. The amount of meat you get out of V cutting it is no different. I just cut, cut, take two strips and then cut the tail off and then you have, or cut the, like the tail section off and you have a pretty good amount of meat. Really good amount of meat. I do soak that in club soda or beer or milk. All those seem to take kind of the oil, oil out of it before I cook it. Oh, yeah, it really helps a lot. And lake trout are amazing to smoke. They're very good smoked. Simple brine, salt, salt and brown sugar, put it in a bowl, let it sit overnight in, in the refrigerator, take it out, wash it really, really good to get the salt off, put a little more brown sugar on and smoke it for a couple hours, it's delicious. I'd like to have you come by sometime when you've got a moment. We've been given, we at the museum here, have been given a number of buckets worth of uh, chip ups. Okay. And we've been talking about doing a winter ice exhibit and then you could help us greatly with that. Absolutely, I could, I'd be willing to also, if you wanted to take the exhibit to the lake, you know, want to do a course in the lake, I'd be more than willing to help run a course out in the lake. Awesome. Because it really is, you know, a ton of information, but if you can see it firsthand, I would, I would be more than willing to take people out and, and, and help out with that. My, my experience has been with a hand sled and a, a little cooker and some spam. Oh yeah, oh yeah, you bring food out there. So I have a, a two-year-old and that, you know, and my wife loves to fish too.